Great, thanks. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. Um, my laptop decided to die on me this morning as I turned it on. I promise it was working early this morning when I edited my talk. So this is a, uh, a previous version of my talk. It had a lot more in it, so I'm going to skip over some things. You'll just have to forgive me for that. Uh, I'm Caswell. I am from Itemba Labs. Uh, I'm also going to have to advance these things the old-fashioned way. So Itemba Labs is a multidisciplinary physics laboratory down in Cape Town. We are part of the National Research Foundation, so that means that our core grant money comes from the Department of Science and Innovation as it is now, uh, something on the order of a hundred and somewhat million taxpayer money. So we are obliged to do the work that we do for the public. Um, there's a couple of things that we specialize in. This is just some background stuff that I have to get through to give you the context of what we're actually trying to do. It is primarily nuclear physics that we do. What I'm going to be talking about is the material science that I am involved in. There is also radioisotope production that we do at the lab. And then we have a department called nuclear medicine. And in order to do all of this stuff, we have two particle accelerators down there. There is a 200 megavolt, mega electron volt cyclotron and a 3 million volt Tandatron, which is an electrostatic accelerator that is something like the Van der Graaff generators that you would know from school. It works on exactly the same principles, it's just you are dealing with 3 million volts instead of the, the few volts that you used to in school. Um, where are these things now? So that is, that is how we also have a lab up here in Johannesburg. We have a department up here. They do very similar things to what we do, but I'm going to skip over that. Uh, just the background on our machines itself, as I said, our, our big machine, our big cyclotron, and this uses uh, varying electric fields, RF, to, to accelerate our particles up to 200 million electron volt. And that's, a, that's a sort of physics unit. If you want to map that to something that you're a little bit more familiar with, that's the conversion for things like joule and, and calories that we all know. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really make sense to think of that as really high energy physics, but it is. Um, and as I say, we get most of our core money from the, from the government, so our focus is research and training. At any one time, we have lots of interns, we have lots of masters, and we have lots of PhD students, not only in physics, but also engineering subjects. The, radio, the radionuclides that we produce at the lab uh, is for, um, they get shipped to hospitals, we sell those things. That is our separated sector cyclotron. That's the big machine. There is no person in this picture for scale. Unfortunately, I couldn't find one of those. But that is a, that's a walkway around the machine. And that, that handrail is at about waist high. So that gives you an idea of how big our, our cyclotron is. But this is not the machine I work on. Um, this is the machine I work on. This is our electrostatic machine. All the controls for this machine, the beam lines, uh, there's a digital control system for that. And we have had this machine for, for a, a, f a few years now. It's relatively new, and we got it from a company called High Voltage Engineering in the Netherlands. And this machine produces for us that we use for our experiments, primarily uh, a beam of protons and a beam of alpha particles. So alpha particles are just two protons and two neutrons, basically a helium atom with the two electrons stripped away. So we have these proton beams and we have these alpha beams those come out of our accelerator and we shoot them at samples in order to do the science that we do there. So we have two experimental beam lines. We call one a micro beam line and we call one a broad beam line and that's just the size of the beam that we get out of our accelerator. So the micro beams are on the order of a micron. We would like to get it down to sort of nano sizes in which case we would call it a nano beam. We're trying to get there. And then a broad beam which is millimeters. So typically the micro beams are protons and the broad beams are alpha particles, and you do different types of, of research with them, which I will explain in just a second. Uh, that is our Tandatron. So injector assembly there, uh, voltage terminals and tank. And then this part was supplied by the company High Voltage Engineering. That's the, the high energy part of the beam line. And after this, this is how it ships from a company. And then you get to the business of actually having to construct beam lines to carry these particles to where we can actually do our research. And that's where our guys come in, our engineers come in. We have to transport our beam down to the physics end stations, and so you need control components in order to do that. So you need hardware and you need software. For the, 
for the transport side, there are things in the beamline. This is not everything that there is, but this is this type of stuff that you have to do. So this is the part that, at a timber, we constructed after the high voltage side. That is a 90 degree bending magnet that you have to control. Uh, that is a magnet that will, it's a seven port magnet that will split your beam down to seven potential beam lines. We have two at the moment, as I said. You have there, it's not a very clear picture, but those are quadrupole lenses. Those are magnetic lenses in order to focus the beam down, same as you would do for, for optics. So you have to control these things as well. And of course, there are high voltage sources because these are electromagnets, they're big. We have Faraday cups that we have to drop into the beam line. That's just a conductive cup that you put in to stop the beam from hitting the sample. Because it's conductive, you can also then, of course, measure the current of the beam. And all of this stuff happens, of course, when you transport the beam from the machine over there down to here, the physics end stations has to happen in vacuum. So you need pumps to pump out everything inside. And you have valves associated with that, of course. Uh, and you do some beam profiling. So you have lots of control components. And you, we've made some decisions about hardware. And, and quite a bit of it, as you will see, is sort of open hardware standards. And then also you need a, a control system to do all of that. And what we, where am I? Keep going back to the beginning. So this is just a closer look at our beam lines. Um, that is the that is the broad beam line, and that is the micro beam line over there. Uh, the tasks for us at Itemba divides up into sort of three broad areas. What I describe now is the beam control part. Then you also have to, at the end of the day, you shoot your particle into a sample, and you take the data that comes off that, and that is data acquisition, as we call it in the physics community. And you have to take that data and visualize it and analyze it in some way. And so these are the open source tools that we have settled on to get those particular jobs done. For the beam control that I just spoke about, it is an open source framework called Epix. For data acquisition, it is something called Midas. And for visualization and analysis, we use Root. And then also increasingly Python, and when Root and Python uh, sort of come together to get to get our analysis done, this is what we currently use. Um, so, for the beam control, all of those elements that I spoke about right now, experimental physics and industrial control system developed at Argonne Labs, um, I think sort of overseen by the University of Chicago, and that is a distributed control system. So you have no no centralized server. Everything is sitting on its own node. We run it on dozens of computers. It can scale up to hundreds. I don't think anybody does it for thousands of computers yet. Um, but this allows you to, to control all of those elements that I, that I spoke about. There is a, a really big library of, uh, well, there's support for lots of different hardware. Of course, obviously, the hardware that we use inside of our, our physics community, and that is Client server and publish subscribe, for the most part, you have what in Epix they call an input output controller. So that is your that is your server. You have your input output controller server thing running on, in our case, x86 machines, ARM machines, IoT devices, and these things are connected to these control elements. Like I said, whether they be power supplies, vacuum systems, uh, valves, your IOCs. Uh, gather information from those components and stores it locally in a database. The records get stored in a database and gets exposed to everything else on the network via a unique identifier that in EPICS we call the process variable. So your IOC runs, gets information from all of those different control components, and then publishes those things in PVs that gets passed over your network via a protocol uh, a channel access protocol. This has sort of changed a little bit into a thing that they call PV access, but at the moment it's channel, channel access protocol. And there are lots of implementations for this in various languages, so Python, C++, Java, Perl, etc. Uh, so yeah, that's, this is the basic structure and this is our implementation of Epix. A bunch of IOC server machines that set, uh, read out information from our components, and then, as I say, broadcast it through the process variables. And this is an input-output thing. So not only does it read out status and pushes that over the network to tell everybody else on their clients what's going on on the machine, but you can also actuate things, of course. So you have analog input-output. You have uh, binary or digital input-output. 
So you can do a thing like on a process variable on a client machine, say, open and close a valve, and then that will that will get actuated on the uh, yeah on the beamline itself. I said there is support for lots and lots of hardware. We are moving to the Ethercat standard. So that is an Ethernet-based field bus. So this is getting away from all the buses that we normally know to something that is easily configurable where you don't have to worry about device drivers. It's just sort of configured through XML. And then you plug your network cable in there, and off you go. You, you, are, you are controlling your, your component. So that's Epix. Um, this, is our, this is how we currently develop things for Epix. As I said, our IOCs live over here. Uh, that talks to, okay, in this case, Ethercat, but of course there are other uh, field buses. And that sits on top of a bunch of Linux machines. This says Debian, but we also have Ubuntu. So it's mostly Debian and Ubuntu that this stuff lives on. And the clients that we have developed traditionally have been developing for the most part is in a thing called Control System Studio. It's an IDE. It's an Eclipse-based thing. Uh, and the code that you write for that is Jython, which is a uh, Python implementation that will work with Java. And that channel access protocol that I talked about is, uh, this is the Java implementation for that. And that is, what, that, is what you, that is what you end up with. This is what you can create in Control System Studio. So, and that sort of represents that beamline picture that I showed you. So this is what we use currently, but what we are trying to move towards is, this is cross-platform, of course, because it is Java, but as is the trend now, especially in the physics community, is to go towards sort of more web-based stuff. So instead of having your Control System Studio stuff, we now have a React.js client and our channel access how we pass these things is through PyEpic. So that is a uh, channel access implementation that you can write in Python. And it, of course, the web framework we use is Flask for that. So this is so everything on the server side stays the same, but your client side, which you still obviously develop in CSS, we are now developing this. So we have a, a nice web interface. That is an example of what our CSS interfaces used to look like. You might recognize things. This is not the greatest, but you have, there's the Tandertron machine that I spoke about. The bending magnet is somewhere in there. And there is your magnet that sends your, your particles down a particular beam line. We just have these two right now. So you have, as I spoke about, these Faraday cups that you can drop in to stop the beam. And then you have valves that will control uh, where the vacuum gets, gets pushed to. So that's what a CSS implementation looks like for our beam line. And that is what the web one looks like. I think that's just in the browser. That's some tablet thing, and that's on the phone. So people like, people like this. Looks good, and it's a lot easier, of course, to get up and running. That's, sorry, I'm, I'm going to try and cover a lot of stuff, but I just want to just give you an, a, sort of a snapshot of some of this open source stuff and how it's helped us out to do, to do the work that we do. That's controlling our machine. Then you actually have to do some physics. Um, this is a nuclear microprobe. Uh, that is our, our broad beam line. And for this particular machine, what we're really trying to do is look at, for the most part, biological and geological samples. And by shooting our particle beam at it, whether it's protons or alpha particles, is from the reactions that happen when the particle beam hits the sample, gathering the data and building up a picture of which elements are inside of our samples, where they are, and how much of it there is. So it's elemental concentrations and distribution. So you have these nice pictures of if you put a plant seat there, you have your physics interaction, you count all of these events, and then you visualize it. That's all of this stuff is about, elemental analysis. So that's what we're trying to get done. Um, and on the physical side of doing that, of course, you have to read out. Once your particle hits a detector, you have to read out an ADC. You have a bunch of counters that you have to read out as well. So there's scalars, and then you want some setup to read out charge as well. So these are the typical things that you would have to do to do data acquisition in physics. There are always slow control components. You have sample stages to move from one sample to the other. And you want to be able to do things like control the run, start, stop. And of course, that data has to get captured, stored in some format that has to be read out later. And then you have to show people what the data look, looks like, both while the experiment is going and then obviously offline as well, and do some analysis. Fitting peaks, subtracting backgrounds, those sorts of things. And of course, the reason why we're here is to do that particular job of physics, we have another open source framework called MIDAS. 
This was developed by the Porsche Institute in Switzerland along with the guys at Triumph in Canada. So it's an entire framework. This gives you uh, all the tools you need to read out all of these modules and pass it along to do things like store the data and analyze it in real time. So you need, of course, hardware support for the types of things that we typically use in physics to read out our detectors. These buses are supported. Uh, some of them are very old, like CAMAC, but of course things are moving towards just reading things out over Ethernet. And Midas, as it is, can be installed on Linux Windows and, and Mac OS. For us, specifically at Etimba Labs, we run it on Scientific Linux and CentOS. And what Midas gives you is, is these things. Um, what is important for us, I'm not going to go through all of this, I suppose. Does my pointer still work? Um, is that you have... It, it, it's a fairly modular thing. So the framework gives you these components where you can just add on to get the specific job done that you want. So you have things like front ends that sit closest to the hardware that you want to read out, like an ADC. You have an analyzer that could sit somewhere else on the network, and that will take the data and perform some calculation on it. There is an alarm system that you can set conditions for. An RPC server that'll pass all of this stuff over the network, so you have all of these various nodes sitting at places on the network. There is a web server that will expose um, the state of the system to you. And what the web server really does is kind of peek into this thing called an online database, which is a real-time database that comes with Midas that allows you to uh, configure your experiment. So at the beginning and end of a run, you sort of look at what the database uh, what the status of database is, and those things get actuated for the run. It also allows you to control the run. So you can do things like by, I mean, we have a command line interface, but then also we have this web server changing a value inside of the database, and then actually that does something different to the experiment. So it's a very nice system. Um, that is, I'm going to skip over that. That's a little too much detail, but. Um, yeah, Midas. And that, so all of that stuff happens, the stuff you can mostly ignore. Oh, there's, there's a system buffer. So how the front ends work is that you read the data out, and in our case, yes, it puts everything in a ring buffer that then gets shared via our RPC server to other nodes on the network, like analyzers that you know just reads stuff out over the network from the buffer. And then uh, formats it into, in our case, well, these are specific formats, which I'll explain in a second. And then of, of some interest, I guess, for open source people is that when we store these files and save them, they go and sit on a known cloud server, and that gets synced to a bunch of other PCs. So that's actually been a pretty useful thing. We used to just dump files somewhere and then FTP them off later. So own cloud has been really nice for just passing the data as soon as we've captured it to, to everybody else who needs to look at it. Um, that is what the Midas web interface looks like. So these, this is where we control our runs. You ODB up there, click on it, and that gives you a, a good snapshot of the status of the run. And then you have, I don't know, it's just, I can't go into the details of what exactly goes into a run, but it's a pretty nice web interface. Um, of course, now you have your data. Either you're busy capturing or you've actually stored it. And that is, in, in, in our case, for that particular machine, it can be up to about 10 kilohertz. 10,000 events per second. It could be a single channel of data for really complicated experiments. We have to do coincidence. It can be dozens or even hundreds. Uh, and you have to store event metadata as well. As the experiment is going, there are other parameters that change other than just the energy of the particle that you're actually capturing. And that stuff has to get stored as well. And as I said before, you have to visualize that in some way. And for that, we have another open source thing. This is root. This is a framework that has been developed now for quite a long time, mostly by high energy physics guys at CERN. And this, this is quite an active thing. And that gives you, that gives you a lot of the tools that, that people might be familiar with in, in Python. So lots of data processing, statistical stuff, and gives you nice structures to visualize your data. So as physicists, there's a lot of histograms. You have, typically when you're, you're acquiring physics events, you have an energy spectrum. You have a range of energies at some resolution and you want to show somebody what that looks like. And so it gives you a lot of those nice visualization tools and also gives you storage formats to put that stuff in. That is wrong. It is, it is a C++-like sort of language that you use to code stuff in, in root. Uh, 
And again, we run this on Scientific Linux and CentOS. It'll run on on anything on anything else uh, on any any Linux. There's uh, Mac binaries. I think there's Windows binaries. And the other nice thing about root, other than being able to do all of these things itself, is that there are bindings for Python. There is a PyRoot binding that if you are building this thing yourself, allows you to just simply import root. So if you have a, a Python interpreter open, you just go import root. And then you can read your root files in. And within Python, you can then make sense of the structures that you have in root, and then do Python type things to your data that you've stored in root. It's, in some sense, a competing thing because you can do similar things, but uh, we, we kind of go back and forth depending on the specific thing we're trying to get done. But this is, this is an awesome thing if you have any sort of data to try and visualize it. So we're very reliant on root. Um, yeah, this, <laughs> this is a specific thing. The, the, the whole point of, of trying to use these open source tools is trying to get as much stuff I mean, you know, why, why replicate things? Trying to write the little amu least amount of code to get really, uh, to solve complicated problems and to get cool stuff done. This happened to be a particular problem. This is what a, this is what a typical spectrum looks like from that nuclear microprobe that I showed you. These are, these are x-rays, characteristic x-rays. Each one of these peaks comes from an element. And for a typical biological sample, you might have lots of them. There is a lot of background. There are a lot of elements that sit on top of each other. And you have to somehow deconvolute these things, divide them up nicely into elements. And using those tools, Midas and Root, this is just, I just want to show you this. Um, that's just a little piece of code. So this is the code I wrote to um, deconvolute that spectrum, subtract the background, separate them from each other. And when you visualize it in Root, you, you get stuff like this, which, which I quite like. This is a this is a biological sample. This is a seed of some sort, and this is also in real time. So as the experiment is going on, using root Midas, you can see very nicely in your seed. There you can get a nice picture of what the seed looks like as a whole, but you can see how nicely separated out these various elements are. So this tells the biologists where exactly their, their stuff is going. There's a lot of sulfur there. You can see how the potassium is distributed there, but these are the sort of pictures we're interested in, and we can get them very cheaply, writing very little code. Um, that is another one for a technique which I didn't explain, so I'll skip over that. Um, there is, so those are, those are the tools that we've used traditionally, MIDAS. But it's also, those tools are very specific to, to the physics community. We are trying to get more in line with what everybody else in the world is using. So data acquisition, just the business of capturing data and then consuming it in some way is not a problem that should be unique to physics. So we have, as Itemba Labs, joined a, a project called The Loss, which is attempting to bring the physics community in terms of the tool that we use more in line with what everybody else in the world is using. So specifically for our data acquisition, we have sort of d decided to change up the, the software stack a bit. And this is what we attempt, are attempting to go with for the future. So instead of using Midas for our data acquisition, Apache Kafka, which I'll explain in a second, do all of our analysis in Python, and then use, uh, in this case, Plotly, but this could be anything. Um, we are sort of biased towards Python type things, but of course that could be JavaScript or anything else. And then Kibana to visualize the dashboards and things that we, that we need to sort of show data rates and all of that. Just quickly on Kafka, because I think that's, that's kind of an interesting thing for, um, for the type of work that we do where we have, you have to have deal with events. You have a bunch of events coming in, you want to put them somewhere. And what we have started using is Kafka, which is a, a streaming service. So you have um, messages coming in, get stored inside of a, a Kafka cluster, inside of logical structures that they call topics. Each topic is really just a uh, a log that is divided up into many partitions. And these partitions are, can be spread out over a cluster on various servers. Um, so each, as I say, each topic is sort of a, a logical unit. Each one of those things have a log. Each one of those have partitions. And partitions are rep can be replicated, depending on how you set up your server, across multiple machines. So you have you know, some fault tolerance in there. You also have a... Um, uh, 
what is called in Kafka the idea of a consumer group. So when you're reading out from your, from your Kafka cluster uh, topic, you have a consumer group which can subscribe to any number of topics and inside of each consumer group you can have consumer instances which could be instances inside of one program or again they can be spread out over, a, over the entire cluster. And for each record inside of a topic, only one consumer instance will read out that particular event or message. So you have the advantage over traditional publish subscribe in that you don't have, um, you don't, you're not broadcasting to every consumer. There's only one instance that will be reading this thing out. And of course it has the advantage over traditional queuing in that it can be multi-subscriber. So this is, uh, this is what we intend to put our data in now. And, and it can function as storage. When you, when you put your event inside of the cluster, it is, um, it is retained on a, on a retention basis that you specify number of days you could have it in there forever. Uh, that's, this is sort of the structure that I took up, spoke about. That is what a topic looks like. It is a log of various partitions. Uh, a message is a key value pair and a timestamp. And then there is an identifier, which is just an offset in that particular partition. So you can have a consumer, you can have several consumers reading out of a of a partition in a topic and it just, ne just needs to know what the particular offset is. So you can lots of consumers running and consuming things at the same time. And how that's going to help us, of course, in physics is that now you have all of these producers for our various uh, groups of detectors or whether they be, like I said, uh, control elements. Um, sitting on this side of our Kafka cluster and we just produce the messages into the cluster. And that can be done in, there are again bindings for lots of different languages. We tend to move towards the Python side, but that could be anything, C++, Perl, whatever you feel like producing things into our cluster. And sitting on the other side then uh, are consumers that can pull things out uh, quite happily to visualize using things like root that I spoke about if you wanted specific Python tools or data syncs that'll put it into formats like Parquet or straight into a Postgres database. So this is kind of the future of, of data acquisition, or where we want to go with data acquisition. Which time do I have? Three minutes? Um, this is another thing, open source stuff that we like using is, obviously what goes along with capturing all of this data is you produce lots and lots of logs as the experiment is running and you want to visualize that stuff in some way. And we've settled on an, on an F stack slightly. So we don't use Logstash, we use FluentD. So we produce in our experiments, this is not a diagram that is specific to our setup, but the idea is the same. You have lots and lots of logs. In our case, we have a Python script that, that runs and pulls data from various parts of the experiment, puts it inside of a log, uh, and pushes that into Elasticsearch. And then we have Kibana, which is just a, a way to visualize stuff that goes inside of Elasticsearch. And then you end up with, again, with very minimal code using this stuff. W what for us is really nice dashboards on things like how fast is your experiment going, what is the event rate, so you get gauges and, and, and nice plots. So these are some of the things that we are we're trying to do. And for the Kafka work and the Kibana visualization work. We are now part of this Delos project, so if there's anybody that finds any of this stuff interesting, um, please feel free to look at the GitHub and see what it is that we're doing. Like I said as well, we are a government-funded lab, so uh, you should probably know what we're up to. Um, so yeah, go and take a look at the code and, and uh, yeah, see for yourself. So this is very quick, I know, <laughs> maybe very complicated snapshot of some of the open source tools that we're using to try and get our, our experiments done. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Uh, um, not yet. There, there, there is talk of, of using some of it, but no, uh, nowhere in our setup. So we're using Raspberry Pi for anything right now. Yeah. How much data do you guys generate per experiment? Um, it, yeah. it depends on the 
type of experiment. So um, for the stuff that I'm working on, we run over, I don't know, a very long run would be 24 hours. And it's, it's not as much as you think. I mean, it's on the order of gigabytes for, for a run of a few hours. So typically, I think at about a, a gigabyte per hour is, is, and that's one channel of data. Obviously, you can multiply that as we add channels. So a channel is literally, um, uh, so one detector equals, equals a channel. Okay, so that would be your splitter thing would be a channel. That's no, magnet, no, uh, that no. Um, so in I didn't really talk about the end stations, but so inside of the end station where the physics event happens, you you put a very small detector there. They tend to be sort of silicon-based things, um, and each one of those represents a channel. You can put multiple detectors there, or sometimes detectors are multi-segmented, and so each one of those segments would be a channel. That's like the detector head in the CERN machine. It's one of those. It's just on a smaller. Much yep. smaller scale. Yeah, yeah. I've heard that thing is quite horrific in terms of the amount of data. It oh up yeah, for. I mean that's petabytes of data. We 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 don't we don't do that kind of physics. In material science, it's not so much about. Um, there's not a lot of data. It's more just the. I mean, it's what I didn't really go into is to produce those images that you saw of the seed, for instance. It's it's. In, in high energy physics, you're just typically counting energies and then you do stuff with them. So you end up with that histogram energy spectrum thing and that's what they look at. With, with our instrument, we're scanning our beam over a, a sample. And so you can build up a picture. You know, you have, it's a raster pattern. So you're scanning in a raster thing and you, each one of those pixels, you count all the x-rays. And when you extract information for each different element in those pixels, you, you, you build up a 2D image, you build up a map. Um, so you can look at what does this thing look like if you only saw the potassium inside of it. You know, so that's the nice part of, of being able to scan our beam over a sample like that. So it's kind of it's kind of like an electron microscope. Just to yeah, see that's other that's very much the Big same. Point. Yes, it's just instead of instead of electrons, it is protons. So what you have is a thing called particle-induced X-ray emission. You you knock an electron out of one of the inner orbitals. You know, an outer one drops quantum physics, uh, and you have a characteristic X-ray that gets emitted for that you know, for that particular atom, whatever the element is. X-ray. Sorry. Do they call it the Z X-ray? Uh, no. I've heard uh, guys who you K L those systems. things maybe, okay. depending on the orbital. Yeah. And, and that's why, when I showed you that X-ray spectrum, right, that's why it looks so convoluted, because you don't have just the one for a particular element. You have all these elements, and you have all of these lines sitting on top of each other, so you have to sort of separate them to make sense of it. And these, this tool, these tools help you do it. I mean, they, they're very nice. We're trying to get stuff done with the least amount of, like, coding effort. And all of this stuff, if you saw, I sort of tried to add links there. You can feel free to go and look at it and sort of read through it. And, if you if you're crazy enough, install it and see if you can do something with it. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the next talk starts in two minutes, so we'll okay. have to wrap up. Right. Cool.